Hey guys, this is John, and I'm playing Fanta 6 in the 15-minute pool on ICC. So Fanta 6 opens with D4. Um, I've been playing a lot of non-D5 systems, so let's bring it back to D5 in this game. I'll decide what to do against the QGD. So let's play E6. We'll play the Queen's Gambit declined. Um, I'm actually kind of wanting to play the Tarash defense with C5. I don't know though. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. I don't know a lot about this line, but I've uh, studied it kind of off and on over the past several years. There's a really good book that was published by Quality Chess on this line a few years back, and that has been my primary reference. It's just kind of like a tricky opening to play because Black often does end up with an isolated pawn. However, they tend to get a perfectly fine position and really playable position too out of it. So this is the main line. White Fiend Kettowing their kingside bishop. It's important for black to play knight c6 before knight f6 so that white can't jump on an early opportunity to pin that knight on f6. So this is all fine. This is all normal. Castle and castle. Now if bishop g5, which is the main move, I will play their recommendation, which is pawn to c4. This is recommended in that book uh, by Quality Chess that was published by that was authored by Jacob Agard. I know I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, and Nico Natirlis, I think, is the other author, the co-author. So C4. C4 is not the main move, or it hasn't been the main move for a long time, but I think its theoretical reputation now is uh, quite a bit better than what it was prior to the publication of that book. So normally you saw black capturing on D4 instead, but C4 is a space grab on the queen side, and black does weaken their d5 pawn to some extent because this pawn is now in front of the d5 pawn, and the focus could be on that, the base of the pawn chain. But it's not easy for white to attack it. Yeah, this is the main move as far as I recall, and I think bishop e6 is what black is supposed to do here. Yeah, just defending d5, because now he could be threatening to take on f6 and remove one of the key defenders of this square, so I will play bishop e6. This is nice, we're proceeding down a main road in the Tarash. The Tarash was played at a very high level back in the 1980s when Kasparov relied upon it in his first match with Karpov. I believe in 1984, the aborted match. And Karpov did a good job of grinding Kasparov down and really making him suffer with the isolated pawn in many of Kasparov's games with black. And subsequently in later matches, Kasparov moved away from the Tarash and he started playing more dynamically. Um, it seems to me like he tried to avoid static positions like the Tarash where Karpov was so strong where he could just go to town on a small positional advantage for many, many moves. So he started playing things like the Grunfeld, for instance. So, But as far as I know, Kasparov never ventured this line with c4 against Karpov. So if he takes on c6, I will have double pawns, but I will get the b-file to operate with. I think f4 is a move in this position. Um, I believe b3 immediately is a move as well. This will test my knowledge of these lines, my memory. For now, I'm pleased to have this position. Okay, e3 seems pretty normal, I'd say. Um, the knight on e5 is undoubtedly an annoyance because I can't remove it without allowing him to take with his d-pawn. And if this knight were to move, then d5 becomes very weak very quickly. So in this position, I'm thinking just rook c8 to further reinforce the knight on c6. And I would like to expand on the queen side, looking towards a later a6 and b5 if possible. So I think that will be my plan. I could also play h6, but don't know if I have to play h6 quite yet. h6 would force him to trade on f6 because if bishop f4, bishop h4, I have g5 trapping the bishop. So if h6, bishop takes, bishop takes, f4... Yeah, I don't think it's necessary to do that yet. I'll play rook c8. I think this move is fine. And we'll see if he goes ahead and plays f4. If he does, he would be threatening f5 to some degree, cramping my bishop on e6. Let's take a look at Fauna 6's stats while we have a moment. So he has played Oh, about 150 standard games, 15-minute games, peak rating of 1970, win-loss ratio of 79 wins, 60 losses, 13 draws. 
So positive record for him. That flag. I told you guys I've been trying to get better at flags. I am drawing a blank on what flag that could be. I'm going to say this is a total flyer. I'm going to say Tunisia. Saudi Arabia. I was going to guess some country in the Middle East. Hmm. All right. So got that flag wrong. <laughs> I had a really interesting game with uh, Akabile yesterday. If you guys haven't seen that game or if you weren't watching the videos over the weekend, go check that one out. It was a Budapest Gambit game. Very interesting encounter where my opponent played the 15-minute game basically like it was a blitz game um, and very nearly beat me too. I don't want to give away the ending, but he was pushing me to the brink and only using about a third of his time for the entire game. So what to do here for white? I mean, black's position doesn't have a whole ton of weaknesses other than that obvious d5 weakness. And as soon as I push c4, I have a majority of pawns on the queen side. So that's why I alluded to that plan with a6 and b5, just pushing a majority. I'd love to activate that pawn mass and start seizing the initiative on the queen side. So since he has a majority in the center and having an e-pawn, whereas I don't, he has a, a two to one uh, pawn advantage in the center of the board, he might be looking for ways to utilize that. That's why I mentioned f4 as a possibility. Um, e4 probably won't happen because it weakens d4 too much, but I think f4 is a very real move. B3 is an undermining possibility that he has. H3 kind of baffles me. I don't know about that move because I wasn't planning on using the G4 square necessarily. So why would he play that? G4, pawn G4 doesn't make much sense. I'm thinking I might just go ahead and continue with my plan with A6. I could also play H6 once again, but I think H6, bishop takes F6, bishop takes F6 will always be met by F4. I don't necessarily gain a whole lot by doing that. Whereas a6 just looks like a useful move and I can play it quickly because I don't think the position has changed much, if at all, after h3. So let's just throw the move back to him. h3 almost looks like a move that you make because you're not quite sure what your plan should be and you're just trying to play a constructive move, which is not a bad strategy a lot of times, but I just kind of sense some indecision by him in this position. Yeah, now he plays f4. Okay, so f5 is, is a potential threat because then I would have to drop my bishop back and d5 becomes weak because my queen would no longer be communicating with that square. So I was thinking I might play g6 here, although I see now that maybe his idea is g4. So g6, g4, and f5 is on the docket. That very well could be. Hmm. I didn't pick up on that when he played h3, but if that was his plan, that's sneaky indeed. So if I take on e5, and he'll take with a d-pawn, and d5 becomes extremely weak. So b5, f5, bishop d7, hmm. How does that pan out? Knight takes d7, queen takes d7, bishop takes f6, wins a pawn. So g6 seems indicated, but he'll play g4 then, I think is what he's getting at. So g6, g4. Hmm. Yeah, I can't prevent f5 at that point. I would have to reckon with the possibility of that f5 move. What if I play knight d7 in this position? Is that crazy? The idea of knight d7 would be to further defend f5 in the event of bishop takes e7, because I could play knight takes e7 then. And if f5, I could take on f5 with the knight. Hmm, looks like a weird move, but it might work. So knight e7, bishop takes e7, knight takes e7 is fine, I believe. So what if knight d7, knight takes d7, 
queen takes d7, f5, and I could take his bishop, so that's no good. I sort of like knight d7, let's do that. Let's go ahead and play that move. It looks weird, it looks like I might be losing a piece with f5, but I don't think he can pull it off. And I believe it's better to do this before inserting g6, g4. I think inserting g6, g4 would only lead to further weakening of my king side, plays to white's advantage. It kind of justifies that h3 move. Okay, so he quickly takes there, and now knight takes was my idea. Just double checking, making sure I'm not going to run into anything. Yeah, knight takes, guarding f5. And d5 too. Now in the short run, I'd just like to get rid of this knight and also make sure that f5 doesn't run me over. e4 is a move I think he might try in this position. I could see him doing that. Taking on d7, he may not want to play because after queen takes, I would be threatening bishop takes h3. And then if, let's say, g4, I could maybe play f5 and try to clamp e4. Because, yeah, actually, I think I would like to play f5 if I could in this position. It might be a, a strong idea. If e4, maybe knight f6. Further reinforcing this pawn. He could play f5 then, bishop d7. Mm, he takes on d5, it might be a bother to get my pawn back. Yeah, the Teresh is not a bad opening at all. If you play it, you simply have to be comfortable playing with an isolated d pawn. That's about it. It's the only major drawback of this opening. So g4. So I can take on e5, or I can play f6 or f5. Those are my candidate moves. Take on e5, f6, or f5. Taking on e5, he'll likely take with the d pawn and still keep open the option of f5. Don't think I like that so much. Um, if pawn f6, I'm wondering if he can play f5. Idea, f takes e5, f takes e6, with a, a weakness on d5. So f6, f5, maybe bishop takes f5? Doesn't seem quite right, though. If f5, g takes f5, I would be unable to take with the knight or the bishop because d5 lacks defenders then. So I'm kind of narrowing it down between knight takes e5 and f6. And if f6, f5, I have, still haven't figured out what to do in that line. f6, f5, f takes e5, f takes e6. Let's say rook takes f1 check, queen takes f1. Hmm. Then he gets to i the f7 square. I don't like that so much. f6, f5, bishop takes f5. g takes f5, f takes e5, knight takes d5. That may not be that bad. Something about it still kind of rubs me the wrong way. f5 is met by that capture. Knight takes e5 also doesn't appeal to me. I don't like that he can capture with the d-pawn. There might be some other move I'm not paying enough attention to, but those are definitely the main moves. I'm going to play f6, and we'll see if he goes ahead and plays f5. That's probably the critical move. I will pre-move this just because there's no harm. So if f5... F takes e5, f takes e6, rook takes f1 check. Okay, he took on d7. It'll be very interesting to see after the game whether f5 was a good move for him or not. This line I'm more or less happy with. 
because I think he'll be stuck with this pawn for a while unless he wants to advance e4, which I don't mind. Like, yeah, my minor pieces are a little defensive, but I think he's slackening the pace a little bit. Like now I can play b5 and try to get my uh, pawn up to b4. So he's trying to stake out space on b6 and c5. So now knight b6 is a threat, which would fork my queen and my rook. So I'm thinking I'll probably play queen d6 against that. Maybe queen b5. Queen d6 is kind of nice. Queen d6, knight c5. It's possible to sack the exchange there, although. Okay, let's just do this. I like the fact that this move um, eyes both wings. Looks towards the queen side and also leaks, looks deep in the heart of white's position on the king's side on those dark squares. If knight c5, I think I can play b6 straight away. Because if knight takes a6, his knight is stranded. Rook a8. He could rescue it with queen a4, although I have b5 then. That wins material. Yeah, he can't do that. I'm happy with this position. I like this for black. I think I might be a little bit better now. If he does something generic, I'll play rook fe8, move this knight, probably start trying to pump pressure down on the e3 pawn, maybe knight c6. Yeah, rook fe8 looks like a nice move to play next. a3, he's trying to keep me out of b4. But I wasn't really planning queen b4 anyways, at least not for the moment. So let's just do this move quickly. Just trying to stay close on the clock. My rook wasn't doing anything on f8, so you might as well move it to the file where it's most likely to be activated. And for now, that's the e file. Him playing a3, he also provides a convenient square for a piece on b3 for me. Like maybe knight c6, knight a5 to b3 is one option later on. Okay, so important difference here. If I play b6, he can take on a6 now because he would have b4 as a retreat square. That is one important detail. So I can play rook c7 if I just want to defend the b7 pawn. It's a shame I can't play b6, but... You know, I think it's... Probably for the best that uh, I don't play that move. What if I play knight c6? Letting him take on b7, but then going queen e7, hitting the knight, and hitting e3 with check. I feel like this pawn is very weak, though. I don't know if I have to trade it, so to speak, for my b pawn. Let's just go rook c7. I think this is fine. This knight could be a problem though. But, you know, I like rook c7 also because when I move this knight, let's say I play knight c6 on the next move, I could swing this rook over to e7. So it's possible it could become like a multi purpose move. Um, now with queen f3, I'm thinking knight c8 might be good because then if he plays queen f4 trying to induce a queen trade, I can swing my rook over and my knight will be well placed on d6. So knight c8 seems weird, but actually it looks promising. I'll do that. What if he goes knight e6? Knight e6, bishop takes, pawn takes. I can bring the knight back to e7. That's okay for me. I'll do that. So I'm right at five minutes now. I have to pick up the pace. I think his knight is practically his only good piece in this position. And I have everything defended in my camp. So I'm liking this. Let's bring this over. He's going to play rook a e1. I think there's no doubt about that. Now, can I put more pressure on e3? For the moment, I do not think so. He wants to go g5 and just crush me on this wing. So what if I play h6 myself? There's nothing wrong with that, I don't think. Hmm. 
Yeah, let's go h6. See what he's up to. See if he really wants to sacrifice a pawn with g5. I think I can just take that pawn and it won't be bad. King f2, wow. Okay, so he's being very aggressive now. Okay, I have a wacky idea that I, I kind of like, though. I've been thinking about it for a couple moves. I just haven't mentioned it. b6, knight takes a6, and now c3. Idea of weakening his queen side. The game is sharpening up. And I think he might not be prepared for this turn of events. So I will do this. Be pretty surprised if he didn't take on a6 now. And then I hit him with this move. So king f2 encouraged me to do this because uh, with that move, it looked like he was very intent on somehow pressuring me on the king side. And I don't think he's really thinking so much about his own position on the queen side. I am sacrificing a pawn, but I think it's a good sacrifice. If he takes on c3, I take on a3, I'm hitting his knight, I'm hitting c3. His queen, his king could be in the line of fire. Okay, that's a good move because it hits d5. Um, now, if I take b2, he takes d5. What is going on there? I think I have to speculate on that, though. Let's do it. So take, I could always play rook d7 if I need to. It's absolutely fine. I could play rook e4 as well. I want to play queen takes a3. I think that would be fun. Might even be the best move. So rook d7, he can play what? Knight back to c3. Or knight b4. He'll probably play knight b4, because otherwise I would take on a3. So rook d7, knight back to b4. Just not quite positioned how I would like. What if just rook a7 attacking a3? Maybe that's better. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Let's do that. Then knight b4 could be met by just a rook capture on a3. I don't think I need to sacrifice the exchange in this position, at least not yet. I have 2 minutes and 50 seconds, though. So anything I can do to maintain the initiative will be good. Make him think. Apply the pressure. When you're getting low on time, it's always easier to be the one with the initiative versus yielding the initiative. Okay, so he's trying to trade queens. If I don't trade queens, is he going to play g5? He might. I think a queen trade is just good for me, though. Yeah, that, that can't be a bad idea. Let's just Check. trade. If he takes with the knight, he's so far away from this b2 pawn. This pawn could become a serious issue for him. And I sort of think he should take with the knight and then push e4, e5, but it's very slow. Say knight takes, I take on a3. Okay, he's going to do it that way. Yeah, but here I can play rook d8 as one move. That's one way to do this. You can also take and then take on a3. But I like rook d8 better. Attack the knight, not lose any time. Knight b4, I take on c3. Knight c6 is rather harmless, I think. Just rook d6 or something, rook d7 maybe. You know, and when that knight is gone, I always have bishop a2 options. Okay, so I think he's going to put... Get the impression he's going to put the knight on b1. Which is all right by me, I suppose. He is going to put the knight on b1. Okay, so if I play rook a1, he goes rook e2, I have bishop c4, rook takes b2, bishop takes f1. Yeah, that's got to be basically winning for me. Wins the exchange, at least. For rook e2, d4 is also hanging. 
Okay, he noticed that. I think he knight e6 now. Let's just bring up reinforcements. This knight does a good job in a blockading roll. It also discourages g5 because I could take on f5. d5, he's trying to keep that piece out of the game. Makes sense. But I can play knight c4. Let's do that. And I could play b5 to prop up this piece. Wouldn't be surprised to see g5. That's like his one of his only remaining moves for counterplay. Hmm. Let's go king f8. I don't know if we're uh, to d3 is threatening anything in particular, so take the opportunity to bring our king a little bit closer. Okay. I have to play faster. Activate this bishop. Seems good. Deciding if I want to put my king on d6 or bring my knight back here. Look there, okay. Hmm, let's just go b5. Okay, here I can take on d5 next move. Don't think that was a good idea. Ooh, I had rook takes b1 on the previous move. Missed that. You guys still have it. Rook takes b1, rook takes b1, knight check, king takes, knight takes. Mm, it's not worth the risk because he has rook c8. Let's not risk that. But yeah, rook takes b1 is a huge threat now. He's not noticing it. Yeah, he missed that move. I have very little time left, but I think it's enough to win. I'm noticing a problem he has too. If he takes on b1, I check. He goes king e3, I take b1. Rook c2, knight a3. Oh, never mind. <laughs> but check. I would have had a knight c4 check at the end of that line if he took on b2. Yeah, this is a queen. Yeah, I think he had to try rook takes b1 in that position, but it was losing. Now let's just not lose on time. <laughs> Given my struggles in bullet lately, <laughs> I'm not going to say this is completely in the bag or anything. Check. But I think I can get the job done with this amount of time. And he resigned. Okay. Well, if I had to pinpoint one move that won me this game, it was the c3 move. Switching gears, attacking him on the queen side. I think king f2 was reckless. I don't like that move for him. So king f2 and then b6, knight takes a6, c3. That, that seed was in my head. It had been planted in my head when he had played rook a1. But king f2 just kind of triggered it, and I really wanted to go for it after he had done that. Let's go back and have a look, though. So standard line in the Tarash. One important point is that white cannot win a pawn here. If they take on c5, trying to double attack d5, black can play d4. And then after knight e4, black has bishop takes c5. And then after knight takes c5, queen a5 check, check regaining the piece. There's been some attempts to prove that uh, white has a small edge in this position because they do have the two bishops. But I know that Eggard book does a good job of demonstrating how black can get equality. If white has anything, it's very marginal. I don't think this is going to refute the Tarash. So after take knight f3, knight c6, as I was saying, it's important for black to develop the queen side knight first to apply pressure to d4. If knight f6, I believe bishop g5 immediately is kind of a problem because then white is threatening to take on f6, queen takes, and then knight takes d5. So it's in black's best interest to play knight c6 first. g3, knight f6. If white were to play bishop g5 now, it's not quite as good. Like, taking on d4 is one option then. 
and then knight takes and like bishop e7, I think would be fine for black. I bet there's even some better move. Like maybe black can even play c4 right away. I'm not sure. Um, or just bishop e7 perhaps is fine. So g3 was played, and then knight f6, bishop g2, bishop e7, castle, castle, bishop g5. An option I played from the white side. In fact, I distinctly recall a game that I recorded from the white side in this position. Uh, D takes C5. This is the surest way to inflict an isolate pawn upon black. And then after take, one plan is A3, followed by B4 for white, and try to play against the D5 pawn, and also try to occupy the D4 square, oftentimes with a move like knight B5 to D4. So that's certainly possible. But bishop G5 has been the main move for a long time in C4. I seem to recall white... One of white's main tries being a very early undermining of the c4 pawn. Either b3 here, or maybe on this move. I think it's probably on this move, b3. But as far as I know, I think queen a5 is the reply, attacking the newly weakened knight on c3. As far as I know, black gets a pretty good counterplay. So he played a solidifying move, e3. I went rook c8. h3 is interesting. Kind of curious what the engine thinks I should do here. It approves of the h6 move. So h6, take, take, f4. Hmm. It says 97. Okay, like holding up f5 and defending d5. That's, that looks kind of similar to the game. But this, this was, it was mentioning 98 too. So trying to instigate a trade of bishops. Yeah, and if take, I assume knight takes e7 is also good. It does seem key in a lot of lines that black free up the f-pawn and move this knight from f6, because that is a little bit awkward. Freeing up the f-pawn would be great in terms of removing the knight on e5 by enabling the f6 push, attacking the knight. a6, f4. Uh-huh. Okay, so what was missed here? Oh, wow, that's, that's an easy tactic. I totally didn't see that. Knight takes c6, b takes c6, bishop takes e7, queen takes e7, f5. Hello. Trapped bishop. And I get two pawns for it, but that's probably not Check. enough compensation, as you can see, clearly in white's favor. You can defend the g3 pawn too. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is not yet lost for black, but... <laughs> I did not have that in mind. Uh, knight takes c6, for some reason escaped my attention. I mean, subconsciously I knew knight takes c6 was possible, but I always thought it would strengthen my center or allow me to play rook takes c6. I didn't connect it to the fact that uh, the bishop may become trapped on e6. Wow, so knight d7 is deserving of at least one question mark, probably two question marks. And knight e8 is safer. Okay. Because then the bishop always has d7 available, if necessary. So for instance, take, b takes, bishop takes, queen takes, f5, d7. Okay, this looks much more reasonable. And hopefully this knight can pop out on back to f6 or to d6. One of those two squares. Alright, well here I was thinking I had played a very good opening, but knight d7 is a bad move. Fortunately, he took that way, and then after knight takes, my position might be okay. g4, I played f6. Yeah, so he probably should have considered f5 in greater detail here. This is the move I was concerned about. I wonder what the engine likes here, because this is where I considered those three candidate moves. Knight takes e5, f6, or f5, all three of those. I rejected f5 because I couldn't find a good recapture after takes, but I guess rook takes is maybe okay keeping my bishop and knight trained on the d5 pawn for defense. Yeah, that might be all right. And also there was something more aesthetically pleasing about f6 ejecting this knight versus f5, like bypassing that knight. But it looks like f5 for white could have caused me problems because, I mean, it's thematic. You attack the bishop, which is holding together d5. And if I were to simply play bishop f7, then knight takes f7 and knight takes d5. This is an easy pawn for white, at the very least. 
So bishop takes f5, rook takes f5, knight takes e5, bishop takes check. e5, check. This is an interesting line. King h8. Wow, knight g6. Check. Amazing. h takes g6, take here. Aha. Uh -huh. And I have trouble because g takes f5 gets mated by queen h5. Wow, so white must have a distinct initiative in this position. Yeah, f5 deserved, deserved more attention. Uh, another line I was trying to assess was f takes e5, f takes e6, rook Check. takes f1, queen takes f1. Something about this seemed unstable for black too, though. Yeah, because he gets into this f7 square. Like, if I were to play knight f8, then queen f7 Check. is highly annoying, I think. King h8, take on e5. He has triple isolated pawns, but he is up one pawn. Interesting. So, two missed opportunities for white. One, not seeing the knight take c6 move. And the other one, maybe not giving f5 sufficient thought. I get the impression he wasn't looking at f5 hardly at all. And he did spend 22 seconds on this move, so he might have looked at it, but... Given the fact that like I was very concerned about f5 and it didn't seem like he gave it too much consideration, I think it's safe to say he overlooked or underestimated it. And sloppy play by me at this moment. Um, I feel like I should have seen the knight take c6 move. This is hard though because there's like three different captures that are possible. And they all have to be considered in playing a move like knight d7. So... So knight d7, trade, and the knight takes, g4, f6, take. Yeah, I felt pretty comfortable now after queen takes d7. f5, bishop back. Because I've covered a lot of my weaknesses, and he doesn't have much to chew on as he did a couple moves ago. So queen d6 is played to sidestep knight b6 or knight c5 with tempo. a3, okay, computer thinks that's fine. Rook here. I'm satisfied with rook c7. I think this move was all right. It serves a couple goals. It defends b7 and allows the rook to swing over to e7 as it did in the game. So I have a small advantage, according to the engine. Not after that move, but it does like knight c6 better. I didn't play that because I thought this might be something, but I guess I can take, and he's unable to take with a pawn because d4 hangs. And if he takes with a rook, then e3 hangs. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, well, there goes my hesitation for knight c6. I should have played that move. I played the slightly more passive knight to c8, which also seems fine, though. Double up, attack the e-pawn. h6. Computer says this position is roughly level. Hmm. It likes king f2. I'm surprised by that. To me, this move seems artificial. I, I would not play that if I were white. Something about, just as in my game with Brownie Baker a few standard games ago, there's something about having a king defend a center pawn in a middle game with this many pieces on it on the board. Kind of rubs me the wrong way. But the computer doesn't agree. It says Fanta 6's king f2 move is sound. Well, let's see what the engine thinks about b6, which I highlighted as being a move that helped me to switch gears and grab the initiative. Because I like the way this turned out. He could play knight a4, but at least then I forced his knight out of the extremely useful c5 square. So he took on a6 instead, c3. Yeah, so if he takes on c3, I take on a3. It looks a little bit scary. Knight b4. I guess if I grab here, he can take on d5 without repercussions. So maybe... Maybe do what the engine says, knight d6, trying to work our way in here. Yeah, because now knight takes d5 would be a Check. huge blunder in view of that. Followed by bishop takes d5 if white were to move their king. Okay, so knight d6 with compensation. I mean, I control these two squares very nicely. And queen takes c3 is still a threat. I, I would take black in this position, given the time situation as well. I think it's... Easier to play black's position, despite being down a pawn for now. 
But this is a trend-breaking move. I mean, white is thinking about their kingside attack with king f2, I think. I think they're like hoping to do this, and then, eight, then g5, and then start barreling down that side of the board. So c3 is a good way to yank them back to reality. And as you can see, I got a big advantage out of this. So after they took on d5, I did not play rook d7, because I thought knight b4 would be their reply. Now rook a7? That seems like a weird loss of tempo. Why not rook a7 immediately? I think rook a7 immediately has to be at least as good as rook d7. Rook e2. Hmm. So if take here, take on b2. And what if queen takes? Rook b1. Okay, and go after this pawn. So Fanta 6 might have an opportunity to win that pawn back before it becomes too difficult to, be, to deal with. Steady plays queen f4, Check. and I traded queens. Also might be a mistake. Queen takes a3. It's preferred. Yeah, I just kind of saw, like, with his queen over here, I don't know if I want to allow g5 with this little time left. The computer thinks it's nothing to worry about. It says, uh, actually says f takes, h takes, and then queen a2, threatening not only bishop takes d5, but also b1 queen with check. Yeah, I'm not surprised I erred on the side of caution with less than three minutes remaining check. and captured on f4. Knowing myself and how I like to consolidate positions, this decision is not unexpected. But he should have taken the knight. I see. And then what happens if rook takes, let's say? He might be able to hold out somehow. Still, though, this seems dangerous. I know the computer is registering triple zeros, but again, with the time situation, I would rather be black. I think I could easily catch up on the clock and with um, my past B pawn and the other past B pawn at the ready. The onus is on white to neutralize my play. Check. He took the pawn, that was surprising. And rook d8, I attacked the knight twice. He went back, I took on a3. This position starts to look lost for white. Rook a4 is also strong. I think I did a good job of converting this position. There's always possibilities to improve, but I was just trying to play calmly. And when g5 was played, activate the bishop. b5 is nice. Good way to keep the knight on this useful c4 square so it doesn't have to move and thereby deprive b2 of a defender. So b5, bishop f3. Yeah, it took. And here, somewhat sloppy, but I missed this move, which wins trivially due to the same tactic Check. that cropped up in the game. But fortunately, it didn't make much of a difference. I took on d5, and he's still lost. I mean, with this knight on b1, he's basically playing down a piece anyways. Rook d8, and yeah, this is still a big threat. His king cannot go anywhere. You know, it can't retreat anywhere or move anywhere where knight d2 check will not be an option for black. I mean, his only safe square is f3 right back there, but it still runs into that move. And this rook needs to stay guarding the knight. The knight cannot move. So it's inevitable that black will get this tactic in. So that's why the computer is registering. The position is lost. Yeah, even if he plays like rook c2, I think I could still do this. Rook takes b1, give check. it a check. Take, take. This position seems winning. His rook is too passive. But as played the game, he played g6, and I got to take. Yeah, check. this is winning. The final line I mentioned before he played rook f2 is that if here, knight check. d2, uh, king e3 is forced, and then take, clearly he'll, he'll have to try to eliminate my b-pawn. So let's say like rook b1 or rook c2, let's say rook b3, uh, rook b3, I mean, or rook c2, uh, then knight d2 attacking the rook. And if he takes here, I have knight c4 check, winning his remaining piece. 
Not like Black wasn't winning anyways, but that would just be a quick way to end his resistance. And same thing if Rook C2. If Rook C2, I have this. Rook takes B2, Knight Check. C4. So, interesting game. Um, I think I learned a little bit about that early middle game and what to look for. And F4 is like an integral part of White's setup against this 9 C4 variation. So I'll have to keep in mind the F5 idea and the fact that the bishop needs a retreat square to D7 because after knight D7 blocking that retreat square, he really could have punished me with knight takes C6, B takes C6, swap the bishops, and then F5, and the bishop's trapped. Um, otherwise, I like the way I played the game. I mean, maybe there was some risk when I played F6 instead of the computer's preferred move F5 right here. But aside from those two decisions, it was pretty well played on my part, I think. Uh, so, uh, before we wrap up, I'm just going to take a look at where we're at on the best list. Oops, that was the one-minute list. <laughs> this is the 15-minute list. Uh, ooh, I'm actually tied with Multicast at 23.51, four spots, three to four on the best list. Gore and Super Chin Chan are way up there. Uh, at any rate, I hope you guys enjoyed this standard video, and I'll be back tomorrow with another 15-minute game. Thanks for watching, guys. Hope you have a good Monday. Bye.